will uh, continue our discussion on uh, grouting in this uh, class and I would be talking about uh, chemical grouting which as you just mentioned is that uh, when the particle size is too fine you need to have uh, chemical grouting. In fact, uh, there is a committee on grouting as I just mentioned uh, there is a uh, uh, lot of uh, activity in international level where international committee on large dams is there, then international committee on grouting is there, there is a group on ground improvement techniques which is called technical committee on ground improvement techniques, uh, they have some rules and um, the chemical grouting is defined as any grouting material characterized by being a pure solution you know and then no particles in uh, suspension that is one definition, but in practice what we say is that uh, it is not just a solution like a chemical solution that you have, you need to have some sort of uh, suspended uh, solids also to see that uh, the in the way that um, it is supposed to be beneficial. Lo so, what we say is that um, it is a, a, a the more of a solution and uh, we have many types of uh, grouts here which are chemical grouting as I just mentioned. Uh, actually there is one reference by Carroll who did lot of work on these lines and uh, you have lot of chemical uh, materials here, it is called they have sodium silicate formulations, acrylics, uh, lignosulphates, lignosulfonates, phenoplasts, aminoplasts and other materials. Actually a lot of material is available on this. As I just mentioned it is a good treatment method for uh, a low vis, uh, where you know you need a low viscosity you know when the, a low viscosity like you know the uh, particles can go slowly into the pore sizes and then because of the chemical action also they can be very effective and uh, each have each of these chemical grouts have a uh, different strengths cost viscosity toxicity durability in fact they have even some effects also because they are all chemicals the major difference between the particulate grouts like we saw you know bentonite or you know cement and some of them there are more particulate grouts, uh, they are called particulate grouts and the chemical grouts is the penetration characteristics we call it penetrability. The chemical grouts can penetrate into soil with finer particles, the penetrability for chemical grouts is a function of the solution viscosity whereas penetrate penetrability for the particulate grouts is a function of particle size. This distinction is very necessary because when you are trying to design a grout you should know what is the uh, size of the particle there. Then if the size of the particle is going to be very little somewhat uh, coarser then one can go for uh, particulate grouts means particles which can be in a suspended form they are bigger size. But in a, when you want low viscosities and uh, other things like the particle size being very low you need to go for chemical grouts this uh, distinction is very essential. Uh, you can see that the grouts, chemical grouts have a big variation, you can see that gravel, sand, coarse and silt sizes are here, uh, uh, the sand, cement could be just applicable to this range cement, but cement plus bentonite or bentonite alone could be somewhat higher. Then polyethylene and uh, polyacrylate uh, pro properties they have somewhat higher, you can see that aminoplasts and others acrylates and something they have a bigger range of uh, applicability for uh, depending on the uh, particle size. Say for example, uh, this material uh, could occupy or serve a big range of uh, particle sizes ranging from gravel to coarse silts or clay soils as well to some extent. And whereas a compressed air also like you know you along with that you know you inject compressed air into the system the possibility it does it enhances the whole uh, issue like it can be useful to some extent in some of this uh, grouting uh, system itself like to increase efficiency. Uh, this is another uh, table that one should have a look at it depending on the uh, type of chemical grout as I just mentioned it could be sodium silicate or silicate, lignochromes all that uh, you have uh, varieties of materials their properties are also here given. And uh, then you know depending on the, we, know, we know that the viscosity is in terms of the kilopascals or pascals the unit of per uh, this thing. So, you can you will see the per second actually. Um, 
gel time is something that uh, we need to understand that uh, what hardening time or setting time. So, you are in some minutes it is given polyethylene it reacts instant instantly with water whereas, aminoplast they have they take some time and all that. So, strength in uh, coarse sand what is the order of strength they get you can see that they have some uh, it is quite good in uh, MPA you know it is very good like you know unconfined compression strength of uh, say clay or sand could be very low it could be just uh, even 100 one, uh, one hundredth of this or much less than that. So, but then we, by adding this some of uh, these materials they it, it gets improved by this much number which is quite good. And there are some issues that are like you know as I said uh, risk and toxicity because there are chemical in nature and uh, so there is some uh, risk associated with that it can be a, a, a risk in terms of the skin allergy and all that house it is a silicate of course, a household chemical um, phenolic resins resp respiratory irritant caustic. So, in some places it is also banned like acrylic resins they are all banned brand neurotoxic ok. Then respiratory irritant irritant and all that. So, when somebody is trying to chemical uh, grouts have been RF effective, but it does not mean that uh, they may I mean one if you do not take proper care the possibility is that they may affect the health human health or operating uh, persons are there. So, but in otherwise they are ok like when you are trying to operate uh, you know during that one should take care of this uh, difficult the um, health hazards then otherwise it is all right. So, some of the remarks are also here that uh, how um, in what in form it is better and all that in the sense. So, for example, silicate only one or two stable gels of high penetrability are there and um, lignochromes hexavalent chromium is, is an accumulant pollutant accumulative pollutant and needs clarification to remove particles particles. Uh, the other chemicals are they have a poor gel time control with high strengths some uh, certain needs you know one should really do some sort of analysis because the fact that you have so many chemicals does not mean that uh, uh, you can use them directly they need to really do lot of one should do lot of studies with the chemical back chemistry background and see that they are very effective and also do not have difficulties when you are trying to handle it in the field. So, I will give you small examples here um, this is a, a in a Michigan state uh, one construction company has done that this is a tunnel uh, and then it is about to be cave, it is caving in it is about 31 meters long you know 6 meters diameter was constructed using the new Austrian method of uh, tunneling. In fact, this is one method of uh, construction of tunnels because the site's conditions primarily consist of fine sand chemical grouting was specified to stabilize the sand and enable open face uh, tunneling. So, in this case um, since a fine sand material is there definitely it caves in and to increase that strength you know when you try to do tunneling like it is open face tunneling what we call. So, one should uh, uh, stabilize it. So, they that company stabilized it with a sodium silicate based grout. The chemical uh, grout was injected through for 41 tube uh, manchet sleeves each one over 100 feet long. The, the this mission sleeves were drilled horizontally into the to maintain an active undisturbed roadway above. The thing is that uh, uh, it is uh, placed ahead of uh, what you are trying to drill and the chemical grouting process created a treated mass of stabilized sand. So, that the tunnel could be excavated with less risk of overburden collapse like the moment uh, you know from the front side like as I just uh, mentioned here like uh, if you are able to stabilize the uh, area much before uh, you uh, start tunneling using this process then it is fine. So, that is what this company did it is a very important case study it is a very good case study that is very applicable to many of the. Uh, um, uh, conditions that we have in uh, underground water and all that. Uh, another important point that I would like to say is that there have been many case studies in fact, uh, for particularly underground uh, um, water control uh, 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 there is some literature that clearly says that the chemical grouting has been uh, studied for about 30 to 40 years and uh, they are quite effective in controlling the infiltration and inflow of underground water and underground structures. See, there is a seepage also. So, how, how is it effective? So, some people, some experiments have been done, uh, which show that 
these materials did not show any signs of distress and withstood number of cycles of weathering as well as their cost effective. Like you know, say for example, uh, we always have apprehensions about is it going to be cost effective, is it going to be durable in the long run because I am just applying a chemical after a period of after a, uh, a few years it should not collapse or does it lead to some other issues. So, all that people have studied at least for some cases and showed that definitely chemical weathering is something that is quite useful. Um, I would like to just uh, stress on some more important points here that uh, there is a spelling mistake. So, rheology of grout seeds here. The rheology has uh, three considerations stability, setting time and viscosity and uh, as I just mentioned uh, the uh, Stability is nothing but it uh, you consider the uh, suspension stable if the particles remain in suspension until they reach a uh, destination. Setting time it is a time required for the grout to harden and it is in the range of 4 to 24 hours depending on the additives used. And viscosity is a proportionality factor or a constant relating shear resistance to the viscosity velocity gradient. Like as I said the there is a force applied and uh, when you just do that it should not uh, uh, they, they it is all they are all viscous fluids like water is one example water has a very poor uh, shear resistance. But when you start adding some sort of uh, chemicals or you know um, solids like sands or cement then it achieves some sort of increase in shear resistance. So, uh, it is also we call it uh, we use that uh, simple law of uh, you know uh, where the we assume that uh, as I just mentioned. Uh, the uh, coefficient of viscosity we calculate and this is a simple example of calculation of uh, viscosity here and uh, suppose you fill up the slurry here and uh, it has two in a two cylindrical tanks one is with radius r1 which is inner one and r2 is radius out and then uh, it has filled up for a uh, height of h and we assume that uh, the bottom uh, does not offer any resistance and you try to rotate this and try to measure the torque to uh, move certain hang, uh, distance similar to our wind shear test. One can calculate the uh, using some simple expressions available in literature one can calculate the viscosity of the uh, grout. So, that is one can do like you know you apply a simple torque here in this manner and measure the uh, uh, viscosity and uh, that one, one can do that. Uh, in fact, uh, people have been trying to understand that uh, uh, the rheology of uh, the uh, fluids particularly. So, we have what is called frictional resistance and uh, we say it is a uh, Newtonian uh, model we use you know and uh, when you just uh, like you know so uh, what it means is that th this is a concept that we have the, the way that you want to model a, a grout is that this uh, the grout has a, a frictional resistance and it also so the, the moment you apply a force it has some frictional resistance and also it has the uh, what is called a viscous effects. So, to model that we use uh, uh, a simple appro approach and we call it a Buckingham Bingham body and uh, say for example, uh, in this case uh, uh, you apply you start trying to you know uh, uh, allow the liquid to flow. It has to overcome initial shear resistance which is uh, we call it tau naught and then as the velocity inc gradient increases uh, then shear stress also increases. This is a simple law. Uh, we are familiar with uh, Newton and non-Newtonian non fluids. Uh, this we assume that it is a Newtonian uh, fluid. Uh, the rheological behavior of the Bingham uh, body is expressed as T is T naught plus mu dV by dz and this particular thing is called uh, this uh, particular term is called rigidity. A thin plate with rough surfaces is to calculate is immersed in the grout and the initial stress can be determined from the amount of grout sticking to the surface. We call it is equal to t, uh, tau naught by gamma. Once the flow time from the cone rig and the rigidity are known, the true viscosity can be determined. Actually, this is called the rigidity, you know, initial rigidity. And uh, see, what the way that we do is that 
uh, you try to pass uh, between the two plates and then once you uh, pass through the plates then and measure the amount of uh, grout sticking to the surface we, we know it is uh, um, uh, T0 also could be calculated and uh, its unit weight is also known. So, one can take that and also at any point of time one can use this sort of an equipment called uh, cone testing marsh cone in which uh, you try to measure the uh, flow and uh, once you measure the flow and uh, there is some uh, simple relationship that is being provided in literature which show that uh, for uh, uh, actually these are all different times and uh, knowing this um, initial T naught by gamma and uh, one can uh, you know how, the how much time it takes to come out flow time is measured for the first liter to flow through like you know 1 liter is uh, it is like 1 it is a 1.5 liters capacity we assume how much time is uh, uh, taken by the grout mix um, to see that the 1 uh, liter of grout has come out and once you know the time and uh, you can find out the flow ratio here using uh, say for example this is all in seconds. Um, so, uh, once you know that once we know T naught by gamma for that uh, same material as I just mentioned T naught by gamma can be evaluated with uh, some that uh, plates arrangement and one can get an idea of what is the actual viscosity because the objective is uh, to get the this one. Okay. So, you will have this and uh, you know this and you will be able to get some understanding of what is its shear uh, uh, I mean what is its uh, viscosity. There are also some more concepts on uh, you know understanding the gravity uh, the, the flow of the grouts in terms of the viscous nature and the viscoplastic uh, flow in pipes and all that. Uh, I mean there have been what mathematical models uh, then you know coming to permeation we know that uh, as I said permeation also needs say for example, uh, there, uh, there are two types of models one is for the strength improvement the other one is for the permeability improvement or permeability reduction. So, for example, here the permeability grouting of soils can uh, needs to be having an understanding of you should have an understanding of the spherical flow model for the porous media, radial flow from the cylindrical cavity, groutability of the soils based on permeability. So, there is some sort of understanding that is given here and uh, the different types of uh, solutions and suspensions they have uh, different levels of uh, permeation and fracturing in the sense that you know their uh, applicability is uh, clearly known. Uh, so, depending on say for example, MC 500 cement and bentonite uh, to what extent they are useful. You can see that the bentonite is somewhat valid from gravel to sand uh, whereas, cement is only for gravel whereas, this is micro uh, this is another type of uh, thing which can be little longer. Similarly, in the case of solutions this is another one that uh, it has it is valid for wide range of uh, uh, wide range of uh, grain side distribution as a permeation grout. Um, so, this is actually if you just see the previous thing I was talking about uh, the three uh, materials one is called ordinary Portland cement other one is a collide cement in which uh, a collide is added like bentonite is added the other one was that uh, another where another compound you know it is just an example uh, to see uh, what is the viscosity how does the viscosity alter with uh, water cement ratio by volume or whatever. So, one can this sort of uh, you know a laboratory work is important uh, to understand because the thing is that finally, uh, you should be able to do the mix design properly in the sense that you should be able to fill up all the cavities. So, imagine that there is some space available roughly some meter cube of material that uh, pore space needs to be filled up when you need that much of pore space and you should have some time also and then you should stabilize there are three issues there one is a uh, space available to fill up all the pore voids and also the grain required is another thing and the setting time you know the thing is that it should uh, set little faster like you know if it takes long time then it is no use. So, 
set faster. So, maybe suppose you want to construct uh, this particular uh, work in about uh, start the work and at least two, one, 2 days ahead you must be able to complete the whole of uh, that and we should expect that that material got stabilized and then you can start excavating there you know, uh, you know so that uh, you can uh, grout or you know, using uh, some of these methods and then start so that uh, working on say for example a tunnel project so that it is safe. So, the important criteria is that you must have uh, some sort of design a uh, tentative design in which uh, uh, the you have the rough area of the pore uh, spaces to be filled up in terms of the volume and also the properties of the grout and also like this all based on the your grain set distributions and all that this criteria we have already discussed. One should be able to establish some of these things very clearly and also it depends on the cost effectiveness also like you know as I said the viscosity. Uh, you know you can see that the uh, yeah, this material has a low viscosity compared to high viscosity there are, so how much which how you need uh, do you need what viscosity you need you know so that it fills up all the volume should be uh, little one should have a knowledge of that okay so uh, it is very important to lot of mixed design procedures and come up with proper uh, um, understanding and one should do lot of laboratory work also it's not just that uh, the concepts are simple because I have seen that things are generally empirical here and we should be able to verify based on certain laboratory tests and uh, see that you come out with a proper mixed design of the grout. Uh, suppose in the case of rock joints and fractures you know the thing is this is a very typical case in many problems in rock slopes and uh, there is some sort of understanding also one should have and uh, they think you know why is this uh, concept of uh, viscosity and uh, its uh, things are required is that you must be able to design in some sense what is going to happen. So, in this case particularly for rock uh, grouting permeation grouting when you are trying to use for rock joints we assume uh, that you have this gravity uh, the discharge here then it exerts some sort of pressure here in the form of a 2D and um, you must be able to uh, calculate the grouting pressure and uplift force in a joint because it should not lead to hydro fracturing you know sometimes if the pressure is going to be higher it, it could lead to fracturing of the rock itself. So, one should be careful in some of these things and um, depending on the type of rock we have different permeability coefficients and the porosities. So, uh, in fact uh, there is certain uh, uh, thing that you you apply some pressure you measure the flow rate and uh, actually the the amount of discharge is measured in terms of the legends what it is legend units where you try to do the in situ testing of uh, permeability, uh, permeability of rocks and uh, you apply some pressure and then monitor the flow rate. So, as you increase the pressure the flow rate increases and uh, as a um, pressure is withdrawn the flow rate decreases. So, in this case there is no problem. So, uh, this is a uh, similar to an elastic soil behavior in which uh, you know the exact uh, say it, it did not lead to any uh, fracturing problems and all that. So, but then I can show you uh, there are some cases where uh, one should based on the type of uh, uh, the uh, response you have. Uh, you can understand what type of flow it is what could happen and all that this is a typical diagram in which if the pressure is applied and the flow rate is monitored this is a laminar flow okay in the case of a rock slope uh, this is a laminar flow in which because uh, there is no much uh, damage to the rock and all that and uh, if uh, there is a curvature here we call it turbulent flow like you know it all depends on the size of the rock joint then there is another example here expansion of the fissure or hydraulic fracturing what it means is that um, you applied uh, some pressure but during the unloading process for the same uh, pressure you have high flow rate you can see here that i just take the pressure at this point and if i just see the flow rate was less here but while uh, at the but then you know when during uh, there is a higher flow rate in the unloading process which means that there is some sort of expansion of the fissure or hydraulic fracturing is there which means that the pressure was higher the another case was that uh, like this another possibility that you just apply the pressure then uh, apply some more pressure 
then uh, the possibility is that then come back then the what happens is that the flow rate is still higher and the, uh, the it is somewhat uh, not uh, sudden and the, it, it shows that the washing out of the filling in the fissures. So, the, you know in a fissures in a rocky joint there could be many materials and uh, you probably uh, they removed lot of uh, the uh, filling material in the during the testing that is what it shows. Like it, it only shows that there is lot of fill, fill up, filled up material in the this thing. So, these are all in situ tests then there is another type that is called blocking of the fissure or the swelling of the rock. In fact, uh, like you see this is uh, one, one type like you low uh, uh, increase the pressure then during uh, the reversal you see that the flow rate is much less which means that uh, which is unusual like you know in the sense that we say that the, there is swelling of the rock or the blocking of the fixture. So, there is a somehow the block got uh, the, there was a block in the that area and that so sometimes you may see that uh, there could be people call use this uh, term called swelling of the rock which is somewhat confusing, but then there is one of the terms that is used in rocks as well. Uh, so, these are all some so based on some of these tests one can understand what is the pore size or what should be the permeation grouting that is required and uh, one should have. So, this some of this information will help great deal in trying to design um, the uh, how to close this uh, gaps. So, now I will just take up some more examples on uh, the compaction grouting and uh, jet grouting because as I just mentioned these are all very popular techniques. Uh, as you have seen just in, uh, in the video as well as in the some um, uh, discussion uh, we saw that uh, compaction grout we have it is called low mobility grout and it displaces and densifies the loose granular soils reinforces soils and stabilizes surface voids and sinkholes and um, uh, it displaces ground and improves the ground conditions like you can see that compared to native soil here there is a densification achieved here and then there is a bulb formation also like it reinforces the soils to some extent though we do not really calculate it is how much of uh, reinforcement uh, contribution is there because we know just exactly we try to uh, what I just mentioned was that it is uh, densification is one important uh, property here then strength improvement by you know forming this column is also another important variable here. So, all these things will greatly help in reducing both uh, permeability as well as increasing the strength. So, if you want to do this you need to have a uh, very good uh, soil investigation done and you should have the site geology and history gradation characteristics and in situ horizontal permeability of each stratum. Typical or type and the condition of the nearby structures and utilities together with plan and elevation will also help in the program because suppose you are trying to do uh, uh, construction the nearby uh, you know in a highly habitated area or urban area you need to understand that that cannot be done that easily and you must be able to protect all the nearby buildings. So, the uh, some of the geotechnical issues that we need to understand also are that. Uh, the in situ vertical stress in the treatment stratum must be sufficient to enable grout to displace the soil horizontally. Like you know as I said the in situ stresses should be somewhat uh, you know uh, we are using this technique in the case of loose sands and uh, the uh, when you apply this the bulb formation should take place and density should uh, you know, it should be able to expand. If it cannot expand we know that uh, the soil is very good. So, the in situ vertical stress needs to be uh, sufficient enable grout to dis, uh, displace horizontally. The grout injection rate should also be slow enough to allow pore pressure dissipation. This is another important variable. Like it should not be too fast because there could be temporary pore pressure mobilization mm -hmm. that could lead to lot of other difficulties. And uh, compaction grouting can usually be effective in most sills and sands provided that soil is not near saturation. Uh, similar to uh, uh, testing in sands near saturation uh, one should be you know see that the quick pore pressure uh, mobilization should not be there. So, we should see that 
um, the you know the soil should not be close to saturation and uh, you know there should be um, of course it could take some time because you are trying to densify the system there. Soils that lose strength during remolding should be avoided. So, for example, the, as I said clays uh, they have uh, uh, some strength reduction because of uh, disturbance. When you have disturbance the possibility is that they should not lead to further settlements. So, we should avoid that type of material. So, greater displacement will occur in weaker soil strata excavated grout bulbs confirm that compaction grouting focuses improvement where it is most needed. Actually uh, what happens is that the excavation the, the way that bulb forms is that it goes towards the area where it is weak. So, uh, the bulb formation will be like that where the improvement is uh, where it is more uh, mostly needed it goes the bulb formation is towards that. Collapsible soils can be treated effectively by adding water during drilling prior to compaction grout uh, injection. We know that the collapsible soils are something peculiar in the sense that they collapse with the addition of water. So, best way would be to uh, stabilize collapsible soils is that you add water then there is a coil a collapse of the soil structure then also do the compaction grouting. So, both uh, combinations of uh, water addition as well as compaction grouting will make the collapsible soil into a better soil. So, that one can do the foundation construction. Uh, stratified soils particularly thin stratified uh, soils can be uh, the cause for difficult or reduced improvement capacity. What happens is that the uh, the bulb formation if it is too uh, uh, restricted because of uh, the ice say for example, if they have alternate layers of dense and loose material uh, which are thin layers then it may not be you know there could be a, a, a efficiency of the process is less compared to a case where you have a lot of loose deposits which are uniform there you have the best benefits. Um, so, here as you just saw in the video that the procedure consists of drill or drive casing you put the casing actually location is very important you know the thing is that uh, say for example, this is all the loose stratum um, this is a decent uh, competent black fill everything is fine, but you have a loose soil here. So, location is very important record ground information from casing in uh, installation like so the thing is that even the uh, the way that you are putting the casing can help you to uh, get some information about the strength of the uh, soil. So, typically bottom up like what means is that we come from bottom, uh, but sometimes it can even be top down. So, we try to come from instead of bottom it can be from top also grout quality is important we expect that uh, you have done a good uh, research or you know good qual uh, uh, mix design of the grout and quality is correct in terms of the contractor that uh, who say you may do something laboratory work or then finally, the contractor should be able to come out with this uh, um, material in a proper way and uh, put it. So, pressure under volume pressure or the volume of the grout are usually limited uh, slow uniform stage injection. So, you try to inject it slow slowly that uh, the formation of the bulb takes place and it is quite efficient. Uh, on site batching can aid control like you know in the site it can be done in batches grout quality is important pressure grout quality and indication of the heave or controlling factors sometimes ground heaving also could take place. Sequence of the plan of injections point is very important like you know where you should start first in this particular plan say once you have the uh, total uh, building plans and all that you must be able to decide where you should start first because uh, or should you come from uh, um, how do you uh, like one by one how do you do that that is very important. Um, typically pressures greater than 100 kp is required to maximize uh, densification limited densification can be achieved with less overburden and this stress can come from overburden soil surcharge and load and uh, foundation loads. Actually, um, uh, in some if the work button is about 100 kPa and all that say for example, 5 meters you know what I meant 5 meters into 18 kPa is about 90 kPa and uh, so close to 5 to 7 meters or 8 meters this uh, uh, effect technique is going to be very effective uh, and uh, limited densification. So, the, the densification is maximum 
in this range that is what people have observed uh, particularly certain companies which, uh, which, which have been using this uh, technique very well and limited densification can be achieved with uh, less overburden that is what I said if the overburden is less you know the you know there is no confinement little bit. So, this test can come from overburden soils like you know if the overburden is there then it is better or even surcharge is there it is better. When densification is the primary intent or the reason a replacement ratio on the pressure gradient is applied on each stage of the compaction grouting. We try to just put in terms of uh, how much of replacement can be done it is compaction grouting volume divided by treated volume if it is 5 to 15 percent it is considered to be good. This ratio is determined based on the existing density the soil density range and the amount of displacement required to affect the improvement. So, you must uh, have a rough idea of the volume that you are going to uh, in, uh, increase or influence you know volume you are going to you know uh, you are densify the system. So, you must be able to have the approximate volume of the voids that you are going to handle so that uh, that uh, you will get a, uh, an increase in density later using this ground uh, improvement technique. Then the maximum pressure criterion that prevents fracture and ground heave and compensates for uh, stiff zones in the they are also important. Um, vertical stages are usually set to 2 feet intervals tight grid spacing generally lead to better results these are some observations and the applications are very good like as I said it can be used in caustic regions where you have uh, the formation of uh, sinkholes and uh, so one can uh, use this technique the treatment usually involves drilling down to down to and into the limestone surface to locate and fill any cavities followed by improvement of the loose soil above the rock surface. Uh, these are all many places in Germany and other places I have seen where you have this uh, cavities formed and it is because of the natural phenomenon and uh, the cavities can be closed using the compaction grouting. You have a rubble fill like a construction fill and uh, which are uncontrolled dumps definitely one can stabilize using this. To close the white spaces and minimize uh, potential settlement impact compaction grouting is applied in a regular pattern this can be done particularly when you have rubble fills. So, uh, you should have a rough idea of the white space again of course, it is not easy, but then <coughs> you need to have an estimate because uh, the advantage is that. Uh, the you should have good quality control uh, in the or the even the measurement of grout going into the system. Then poorly placed fills like suppose say we know that the compaction is not done for the fill uh, well then if there is sufficient overburden a proper program of compaction grouting can treat the poorly placed fill material. I have uh, told you some case where uh, they you know 10 meters of filling has to be done the first 2 meters it was not done well next 2 meters it was okay then next 2 meters was okay. But then say when you the problem is that uh, after say 5 or 6 meters of depth we are suppose you realize that based on the CPT tests or uh, SCPT tests that the soil is not good at uh, location the best way would be probably that uh, you need to find out its density and back calculate uh, certain things and find out if you can densify that area. So, poorly placed fields also could be stabilized using compaction grouting. Then loosened soils uh, construction generated ground disturbance can often be the cause of loosening like what happens uh, because of the con construction induced vibrations and all that uh, there is a loosening of soil structure and uh, what happens is that if you are able to uh, that could affect the buildings lot of buildings like uh, this is a case you know in some cases if you try to do some excavation here there is a possibility of uh, instability occurring and then that could lead to some problems. So, one should really analyze this problem and uh, affect uh, the improvement and it is possible that you can use this technique and you can inject the compaction ground soon after the disturbance occurs and it can compensate for the disturbance by re-establishing the original stress and preventing the deformations beyond the working area. Suppose you have uh, known that there is a loosening of likely loosening one can do the pretreatment like what happens is that there could be a, a ground movements that could occur because of certain excavations and refilling and all that one could understand that yes the possibility is that if you remove the soil here uh, there is a possibility of disturbance of the nearby soil stratum they may get uh, stress release will be there because you remove, you remove excavation 
uh, so much of cubic meters of soil is uh, removed in one area, uh, the, the other uh, the all nearby areas they tend to relax because the soil uh, under the, their foundation start uh, coming this word uh, towards the ex excavated area and one should stabilize that. So, one could anticipate those things and then stabilize. Of course, it can be very effective in the liquefiable soils also and ground treatment consists of dense density increase, cellular confinement and uh, reinforcement of course. Soil permeability is another important uh, parameter in determining the rate of compaction grouting. Of course, collapsible soils also is very effective this we can have seen. So, that way the advantage of the compaction grouting are that it can pinpointedly treat, it, uh, treat the area, speed of installation is good, wide application ranges, effective in a variety of soil conditions can be performed in a very uh, tight access and low headroom conditions, non-hazardous, no waste spoil disposal. Like you know sometimes uh, if you use certain techniques there is a waste also generated like 10 percent, 5 percent there could be some uh, difficulties of disposal. So, here since you are using a particular uh, 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 grout there could be a possibility that there such possibilities are less here. No need to connect to footing or a column. So, in some cases sometimes it is required to connect to footings or columns if you are trying to use uh, some techniques, but here there is no such uh, requirement like you are trying to uh, put some pile foundations. Pile foundations should be connected to the original structure because they have to take care of the load. Some of the load that uh, is the, the should be now imagine that the uh, uh, load is not uh, uh, the particular pile foundation group is not able to take care of the load and then there is a possibility of differential settlement. Uh, so, you need to put additional piles. So, additional piles have to be connected to the original system in which uh, there is a load sharing proper load sharing, but then imagine that it is not done um, uh, like you know, it can, uh, then it is a serious structural problem in that uh, case. In this case what you are trying to do is that by improving the ground all round close to the pile foundations we see that the piles are um, they say for example, you design the piles based on the skin resistance and uh, shaft resistance if that is going to be little higher then it is fine. So, non-destructive and adaptable to existing foundations economic alternative to removal and replacement or piling ok. Able to reach depths and unattainable by other methods en enhanced control and effectiveness of the institute treatment with another systems ok. Uh, just small examples. Uh, like in a wastewater uh, lift irrigation scheme and the shaft was designed as a series of 10 feet deep concrete ring sections installed from uh, top down. Like you know what you do is that for a water supply uh, treatment plant or whatever you need to construct vertical shaft. Vertical shaft how do you construct vertical shaft? You have to uh, have a series of rings place them ok. So, if you want to do this uh, you have to stabilize you know it is not easy to uh, do this sort of construction ok. So, because say for example, as I just mentioned um, it is a 40 meter deep about 10 meters more than 12 meters deep and about uh, each uh, 30 feet diameter you know diameter of the shaft is about uh, 10 meters. So, the material is uncompacted native silty sand. So, the shaft was designed as a series of uh, you know design 10 feet deep concrete ring sections installed from top and uh, so the, the bottom one reaches the designation level. So, for this compaction grouting was undertaken to densify the disturbed soils uh, between uh, 30 feet and the previous uh, this is what they have done. So, what they found was that uh, there were some problems that they were facing during the construction process. So, finally, I mean the uh, uh, the problem due to side friction was overcome by air water jetting and additional fill was placed due to restore the side to grade. So, it is possible to uh, solve even uh, construction of uh, some of these uh, issues construction of shafts vertical shafts in this manner. So, this is a shaft, this is a structural fill and this is how it is done. So, normally to ex to do a shaft like this it is not very easy like you know you are trying to do a vertical like th think of a well of say uh, this is a 10 meters here. 
if you want to do that the, the problem is that you should design for this air pressures and there will be lot of problems and the soil is so loose. Uh, so, the, uh, the technique was that they said that uh, you know uh, you, you they are placing the rings. So, how do you place the rings? So, it is not easy and uh, so what they did was that compaction grout was here placed and uh, stabilized the whole area was stabilized and the air pressure coming on this was less. So, this is how it is done. So, that is about uh, compaction grouting. Now, I will just give some more examples on the jet grouting. Um, as I said, jet grouting has uh, you know you have seen uh, you know, three types it has, we will see that. Um, jet grouting is a uh, uh, grouting technique that creates an in situ geometry of soil crete. We call it uh, instead of concrete, we call it soil crete here using a grouting monitor attached to the end of the drill or stem. The grouting monitor is advanced to the maximum treatment depth, you take it to the maximum depth. High velocity fluid jets are then initiated from the ports in the side of the monitor. Like you have seen there are single type 3 second and 3 uh, jets are there and the jet grouting jets will come. These jets erode and mix the in-situ soil as the drill stem and grouting monitor are rotated and raised. So, by you know in this process the material gets mixed up and uh, the soil crit is nothing but you know it is a so the uh, material that is densified uh, column a densified material it is a grout, grout mix actually. So, the excess soil crit rises to the surface through the borehole analysis where it is contained and disposed of this is what it is done you can see that jet grouting you know you have done one in inclined then the other one is coming like this see it has that uh, it creates because of the pressure it is mixed. So, actually I must thank uh, this uh, Hayward Becker company in which uh, you know they did extensive work you know I, am, I have taken lot of material from them where they are able to do this uh, show uh, very cleanly how the techniques are done ok. So, you can see that uh, this way it is done. So, this is an example of a soil uh, jet grouted soil crit columns to underpin and provide excavation support for this wall at bare health care facility in uh, Walpur area. Like you know you have a building here just next to that ok. It is not easy to go for an excavation like this it is so tough. So, they used uh, this method which we just saw just now see doing like this and uh, now there is no stability issue at all. Jet grouting stabilization at uh, another place for the construction of new sewer tunnel you know at the another place ok. So, this are all you know the vertical shafts vertical shafts and tunnels you know actually imagine that you need to construct vertical shafts and the tunnels and all that and stabilize the whole area. and. Uh, it is not easy you know these are all uh, very complicated structures um, um, particularly design may be easy, but doing construction and it is not very uh, it is not very easy one it is very challenging and uh, one should really see that whatever are the geotechnical issues that uh, they do not uh, give uh, difficulties in the erection of these facilities. So, depending on the application and the soils to be treated there are pri three primary uh, systems of jet grouting. A single fluid system soil called soil crete S. Yes. So, we have a single fluid the injection of the cementitious grout slurry at high velocity to erode and mix with soil this was single jet. I showed you that examples I will show you again. Then double fluid system soil crete D we call it it is S is single D is this thing. The injection of the cementitious grout slurry at high velocity sheathed in a cone of air at an equally high velocity to erode and mix with soil. So, you have uh, grout slurry plus air, then you have triple fluid system we call it soil crit D T in which you have water plus air plus the grout three of them coming together is a single fluid system growth plus air and all that term triple fluid system ok. 
there are more variations of these systems than they are systems themselves, but in most cases they are a bottom up process like we try to do from bottom. Okay. This is to say that they use hydraulic rotary drilling to reach the design depth and at that point initiate jet grouting pyramid, uh, uh, and, uh, pyramid produce uh, procedures to create a uh, cementitious matrix soil matrix commonly called soil crate. During grouting the borehole annulus must be large enough to permit unimpeded up whole spoil return like you know while uh, in the annular space you know when you are trying to do that the uh, spoil whatever is it should be able to come up. This allows for the control of the in-situ vertical stress environment a lack of this spoil return will result in hydro fracturing of the uh, ground on the loss of control. Loss of this ground control can lead to extreme inconsistencies in the soil grid quality and geometry. These are some issues that they have like again uh, you can see that jet grouting process and the way it is done single jet. Uh, yeah, it's like you know. So this is how it is done. The uh, pre-drilling or the foundation may be necessary to access the uh, treatment zone. Other emerging jet grouting systems include super jet or X jet. There are some advanced systems as well in this case. Super jet system means a double fluid system reliant on specialized tooling and high injection energy for an enhanced erosion capability, maybe up to five meters diameter. You know. See the, what is that erosion capacity? It is in terms of the diameter of the column that we are thinking. So, if you have a super jet system, it needs about 5 it can create 5 meters diameter columns. Think of very, very soft soil, Japan, you know, and many places, of course, in India. This is the way that they have been doing it. Like, you know, we know some institutes in uh, Saga and other places, soil is so soft. So, they have to go for advanced uh, ground improvement techniques like this. XZ system, a triple fluid system using a pair of colliding uh, erosion jets to create a more uniform and controlled diameter of the treatment. They have a colliding jets here, that is the difference. So, what I would like to uh, show to you is that the ground improvement has been a very versatile technique and has been proven to be suitable to many ground improvement applications. And uh, these are all the references that I have followed uh, for this. Before I just conclude, I think we should just have a look at uh, some of the videos that we have done again, uh, so that it uh, uh, enhances your understanding here. Like as I just mentioned, this is a single one. Of course, as I just mentioned, uh, this was done in India also by Keller and other group of companies. There are companies doing uh, business in these lines. You can see grout and air coming. You can see that the spoil you know whatever is a spoil that can come out with that is also there. So, you have air, water and the grout. Yeah. You can also have a look at the compaction grouting. The way it does things. Here you can see that it's somewhat slower, as I just mentioned. The poor pressure mobilization, dissipation, they're all quite important. Like it has uh, a different way of. Uh, You can see that they so thank you.